Local programming on KRWG Public Media made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Fronteras at Changing America. I'm your host, Anthony Moreno. Recently, it was announced that Mexico and the Trump administration struck a deal on immigration, suspending President Trump's tariff threat on Mexican goods to the United States. However, we still have some questions regarding the so-called agreement. And to help us gain better perspective on the issue, we are joined in studio by Jerry Pacheco. He is president of the Border Industrial Association and executive director of the International Business Accelerator. Mr. Pacheco also writes a column for the Albuquerque Journal titled Business Across the Border. Jerry, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Anthony. Good it's great to, to great to have you back in studio. Now, I, I want to kind of start back. President Trump called for Mexico to curb migration. He was blaming Mexico for not doing enough. He said on um, folks heading up north to the U.S.-Mexico border seeking asylum. Now, I'd like to hear your thoughts on you know mexico doing enough to stop this migration just once you heard that threat and the tariff threat as well what were your initial thoughts well it is a common problem amongst uh, our two nations uh, certainly mexico has been inundated by a lot of the the central americans from the northern triangle as they call it uh, that are coming through mexico passing through mexico to come to the united states um, a lot of them already are being um, uh, maintained or detained in Mexico in uh, various places, public uh, gymnasiums, for example, what have you. Um, I thought it was a, a, a strange diplomatic twist to kind of, uh, and I, I, I didn't agree with it. I don't agree in, in, in meshing uh, trade with migration. They're two completely separate issues. So my initial reaction with that was it's a common problem, but you shouldn't use uh, a threat on the trade area to kind of address the problem in that sense. Now, both of these issues, I mean, just migration in general is an issue that U.S., Mexico, countries around the world have been struggling with, especially in recent years. Trade as well in recent years has been a complicated issue. So putting these both issues and merging them as one, I mean, it how- It more complicates the matter. Uh, I, I always say uh, to people that uh, what we're doing is, is, is almost self-defeating because if you consider that about two thirds of the products that come from Mexico that are manufactured products have some type of US origin. In other words, the plastic that comes in a product might be made by a plastics firm out of Chicago. The metal fabrication may be out of Santa Teresa. It's incorporated into a larger product, product and then we import that product. And then maybe it stays in the United States or goes to the rest of the world. Well, by, by threatening a 5% tariff, it's akin to us taking a pistol, uh, yelling at Mexico and pointing it at our own foot and saying, you better do what we want or we'll shoot ourselves in the foot. Because we're the, we're the people that are gonna pay that tariff. The companies that are in that supply chain, chain most likely are going to shove that down to the consumer, and that 5% is going to end up on our plate. Now, you mentioned the 5% threat that President Trump had threatened. Now, he also uh, threatened to raise that 5% month by month, e another 5% each month. Um, with that threat, what were your thoughts when you initially heard that? Well, my thoughts were this. Um, if you look at, at how he's operated in, in certain other situations, I thought there was a 50-50% uh, percent chance that he would implement it or he wouldn't implement it. And I didn't lose any sleep over that because it's, it's, it's hard to say come the day whether he's going to impose that or not. Um, and I was picking up feelers thinking, well, the negotiating team is teams are negotiating, the president was a little uh, scathing in his review of the progress. But as we got closer to the last weekend, before the Monday deadline, he started uh, commenting more positively on the negotiations. And I thought, okay, it's not gonna happen. But then the next day, right after that, he uh, threatens it again. And so uh, we've had a, 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 a roller coaster ride, topsy-turvy on the border, let me tell you. Now, with this tariff threat, there was also some talk by House Democrats about 
them getting on board with the agreement that was already in place with the United States, Mexico, and Canada. The new new NAFTA of, if, is what people are calling it. Um, so do you think that that played a role as well as House Democrats talking about slowing down the approval of that agreement? Well, yeah, because I don't think what the president did uh, necessarily or absolutely <laughs> helped him in his favor in trying to round up those votes to ratify that uh, the, the new revised NAFTA. Um, it also begs, uh, you know, the question, is that uh, agreement worth the paper it's written on? Because if, if you can have uh, an executive in the United States uh, with an agreement in place claim national security to impose tariffs, uh, when it's a stretch, uh, meshing trade and, and uh, immigration, then really what, what does that treaty mean? What does it stand for? Is it worth the paper it's written on? Now, just in general, with this instance, and then there's been others in the past with NAFTA and, of course, when President Trump was running as a candidate, how do you feel that businesses have been impacted, especially those along the border with these types of threats? Well, I mean, in a macro sense, I've seen businesses postpone uh, new investment. I've seen businesses postpone hiring new people because they want to see what's going to happen. And, uh, you know, several months ago when it was announced that the new NAFTA agreement was, was in place to be ratified, that we all agreed to the terms, we, we, we breathed a collective sigh of relief. But now it's like, is that really going to happen now? And uh, are we treading in some really uh, dangerous territory whereby uh, we have a president that even before it's ratified is starting to threaten tariffs on our, our, one of our most important trading partners? Um, it, it's, it's all, um, it, it all serves the purpose of creating an unstable environment where companies don't want to invest. They don't want to put any more employees on the ground. And then particularly this latest crisis, what we saw is companies rushing to bring their products in from Mexico. And our ports of entry are already strained because a lot of the customs agents were reassigned to Border Patrol. So less customs agents, longer waiting times for trucks to cross the border. Well now, because of the latest tariff threat, what you have is more trucks trying to cross the border as quickly as possible and make as many turns to bring that product here. And then there was a scurry for warehouse space on this side of the border because everybody wanted to bring the product, avoid the 5% tariff, get it in a warehouse, and uh, save some money. And it just created chaos at the border. I mean, it brings you back to this childhood game red light green light <laughs> you know you, you people are st st stuck somewhere and then all of a sudden there's green light and you have to hurry up and and get everything across the border is that really what that, it's that, like i mean in, in in very basic terms that's exactly what happened and uh, we're very fortunate at the Santa Cruz Port of Entry. We have a port director, Fernando Tome, and a team that, is, that works very closely with the trade community. And we're tweaking here, we're moving hours there. There's great communication, but those guys are, are you know, up against a wall handling the, you know, the situation down there. Now, I mean, there's obviously the issue with trade and tariffs and how that's impacted business. But I mean, a, a lot of the issue too, though, has been, you know, the influx of migrants we've seen over the last year, a record number of amount of families coming up from Central America and unaccompanied youth seeking asylum uh, in the United States. And obviously that's, that's made an impact in Mexico and the U.S. as well as border communities um, are preparing or trying to do what they can to help, help um, migrants seeking asylum in the U.S. Uh, I'd like to hear kind of your thoughts really on how this whole thing that's happening is really playing a role with people from other parts of the country or around the globe who are considering investing in your in the area that you're working at. Well, it, it does have an effect because if you are manufacturing a product um, or you're importing uh, as a distribution center a product, uh, there is a time to market sensitivity. And long wait times at the ports of entry just create inefficiencies, add cost. That adds to the final cost of the product uh, to us, the consumers. And uh, let me tell you, there's very few instances in a, in a supply chain where anybody in that supply chain simply eats that 5%. It's usually passed on to the consumer. The other thing that's difficult uh, is that uh, many people don't understand that there are elements within the supply chain. I may be a company that takes your metal fabrication and punches holes in it as the next step uh, for a computer or something. 
I may have a contract with Dell Computer for, for uh, a year. In other words, that's set in stone. I can't change, and these disruptions coming out of Washington really wreak havoc, havoc on my business. And I've got a contract that I've got to supply X amount uh, in a year, and I've got to do that. Now I may be subject to you know the five percent. I got to try to push that down the line. But the immigration issue um, is 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 a very serious issue, and I think we're we're, we're trying to put band aids on the issue. You've got to you got to attack it at its origin. You got to find out what can keep the people in their countries, what can make them safe. Uh, how do you get rid of corruption? How do you bring economic development to these countries? Because if, if we're just simply picking on our neighbor for, for being a pass-through and, and, and making them the, you know, ha share the burden, we're not attacking the problem, which is further south in Central America. Now, I mentioned at the beginning of the program that Mexico and the U.S., uh, the White House said they had an agreement on um, on this issue. Now, uh, the White House said that Mexico has agreed to curb migration. Uh, there's been reports already of uh, immigration agents in Mexico stopping buses mm -hmm. and uh, large vehicles in the southern part of the country. Um, I'm kind of curious though, like from your familiarity with Mexico, uh, do you have any thoughts on, on if there is a big push from Mexico to enforce migration or do their what they can to curb migration in that country. Uh, do you have any thoughts on how that's going to make an impact with the country? Well, let me start by saying that Mexico is a country that has limited resources, even internally to take care of its own uh, domestic problems. Now, AMLO, the, uh, the Mexican president, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, uh, during his, his campaign and during his presidency has committed to form a National Guard and he wants that stationed across the nation for security purposes. It's an interesting thing in terms of what was called out in terms of victory by the Trump administration. Mexico essentially was doing what it said it was going to do months ago, okay? So I think we backed ourselves in a corner in the U.S. and we're saying, okay, now we're pushing them and they're going to do this. Well, they already committed to doing that. Um, I think Mexico has limited resources. Um, I, I, d dealing with the hundreds of thousands of immigrants uh, a National Guard of 6,000 you know, guardsmen, I don't know how much impact that is going to make. I, I really don't know how much impact that's going to have. And uh, to, uh, to expect Mexico to expend a lot of their domestic monies on an issue that, that really is ours, that the people want to come to our country, they're not migrating to Mexico. We all have to work together and we have to work together in a spirit of cooperation, not one where we're pointing fingers or, or threatening, slapping tariffs on each other. That, that's not going to work. Now, we've seen countries across the world on, in how they've dealt with uh, refugees or people seeking asylum. Um, Germany ha and, and countries in Europe have had repercussions when they tried to address the issue, causing a rise in nationalism according to many analysts. Um, so I'm kind of curious, do you think that this could possibly happen in Mexico, a uh, political cost to what's happening right now? And could that impact the agreement that the United States and even the partnership that, that the United States has oh, most with definitely. Mexico? Most definitely, because what, what we are doing in, in, in um, a sense is destabilizing the presidency of AMLO in Mexico. We're making him look weak. Uh, he's, he's under severe criticism for kowtowing so much to the United States. And Mexico's been the polite partner. Every time they get insulted, they say, we're, we're, we're going to work with the United States. We're going to see what's going on, this and that. And in my experience, and I, I've been all over the world, Mexican diplomats are some of the best trained diplomats that I've ever seen. They're polite, they're polished, uh, but I can't help but think what kind of long-term damage are we doing to this relationship? Mexico, uh, 30, 40 years ago, uh, up until the, the mid-1980s, was very anti-U.S. in its, its diplomacy. Anything the United States was for, Mexico would vote against, and it was an antagonistic relationship. Through things like NAFTA, that has changed and we've become very close allies and good neighbors to each other. Um, I, I'm worried that these 30 years or so of good relations are now being uh, just damaged beyond repair for a while. Now, it's been mentioned many times, you mentioned it, that Mexico is the United States' most important trading partner. Could you help our audience uh, with some context on why it is? Well, I mean, uh, uh, between 1.5 and 1.7 billion dollars 
of merchandise crosses that U.S.-Mexico border every day. Millions of U.S. jobs uh, depend on trade with Mexico. In Santa Teresa, New Mexico, right at New Mexico's border with Mexico, we have 60 some odd companies. Uh, out of the 60 some odd companies, only two are from New Mexico. We've recruited all these companies from all over the world, from Turkey, from Japan, from Taiwan. We've got uh, companies from Canada, we've got Switzerland, yada yada, you name it. Not to mention companies from, uh, from uh, California, Chicago, Kentucky. We've got all these companies. We built a supply base to Mexico's manufacturing engine down there. And so we're tied like this. And it's not easy to say that's Mexican trade. Mexican trade and U.S. trade is intertwined. Our product, there's, there's very few products that come from Mexico, maybe other than agriculture or raw materials, that doesn't have a foreign component. And that foreign component is usually a U.S. production input. Very important for us, that trade. Now, this whole incident, this whole issue with the tariff threats on Mexico and now the agreement, the whole process, there's been another country that has been watching closely and they have a very <laughs> large economy and that is China. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on that? What does this give to China, this whole incident? Um, does it put us in a better place or worse place? I think it weakens our position with China, and I'll tell you why. Um, what did we essentially get out of this latest victory, of a plain chicken with Mexico on the 5% tariffs? Uh, it was announced that Mexico is going to deploy their National Guard to, to deal with security issues. They already committed to that months ago. Um, did, uh, migrants are going to have to stay in Mexico until the case is processed. There's 10,000 right across the border waiting for their case to be processed, okay? Uh, a safe third country where uh, the, the immigrants from Central America would have to apply for asylum to Mexico. Mexico took that off the table. We didn't get that. So what did we essentially get? We got backed into a corner. We, we claimed victory and spiked the ball on everything Mexico already said it was going to do. So if you're China and you're thinking, wait a minute, these guys, look, look at what they did to themselves here. We can probably play a little more hardball or maybe we don't have to take the threats as serious uh, when they try to twist our arm. Uh, I, I think it really weakened our position with China. So with this trade war with China, how, how do you think it's, it's uh, going to play out coming, in, coming forward? What are some things we need to consider moving forward when trying to negotiate with China? Well, there's only a certain amount of, of, of products left of, uh, coming from China, importing the United States, that can be tariffed. My big worry is that the U.S. and U.S. companies, U.S. industry, has a tremendous amount of investment in China. And you're talking an authoritarian government that can make life hell for these companies. It could, uh, it could uh, raid them. It could increase uh, permitting, uh, you know, or, or even employment uh, conditions. And, and that's going to hurt. That would really hurt. The nuclear option that China has is that they hold so many, I think it's a couple of trillion dollars of U.S. securities. If they really want to hurt us, but that's shooting themselves in the foot also because they're holding these assets. If they flood the market by selling those assets uh, on, in, in the global financial market, the value of our assets goes down. That means that uh, we get less money for selling our, our U.S. Treasury uh, securities. That means that you and I, when we go buy a house, our mortgage, uh, our interest rate on our mortgage goes up. Everything becomes more expensive because we get less for our securities to float and to, um, to keep our, our national debt. Uh, it's like kicking a can down the road, and that's what we're doing with our national debt. That's the nuclear option that China has. So with this trade war, I'm and you know these tariff threats, what is it doing to really, um, I guess, what is it doing to uh, economic growth across the world? Well, it's slowing it. Um, I've read various reports of the billions and billions of dollars that have been lost because of what's going on here. Uh, you know what the stock market's been doing, it's a roller coaster. Now, this morning it was up again today, and, and I think it's breathing a sigh of relief after the, you know, the, the tariffs were averted, but I, I I think the, the ultimate role of government, other than providing national security, and the migration issue is definitely a national security issue, and we have to address that. But the other role that I see coming from industry and from business is government has to create a stable environment that will encourage and nurture investment and job creation. 
and we, get, we gain more wealth, we become uh, more satisfied with our lives, we give our children opportunities, we bring people out of poverty. This kind of day-to-day, -day, what's going to happen, I, I, I wake up and I look at my smartphone with one eye closed because I'm scared to look at the news. And that's no way to conduct business, and we need a more stable environment and a, a, a more steady hand on the wheel. I mean, so far we, we've seen uh, tariffs, we've seen threats of even more tariffs on different countries. We've seen the U.S. and, and China go back and forth, um, you know, with old words against one another. I, I kind of think, you know, what do people really need to consider? Because, I mean, this has been going on for some time, and there may be some people out there who are a little bit numb to a lot of the chatter and the threats. But you, there's, you know, when we're talking about trade, when we're talking about uh, countries' economies, things can get very serious. So what are some things people need to consider regarding this? Well, I mean, first and f uh, foremost is that you're going to pay more for your products, okay? Um, we're not going to stop shopping at the Family Dollar or the Dollar General Store. And I always say this, uh, the most vulnerable elements of our society are the ones that are going to get hurt the most. Yeah, I stop in the Family Dollar and I buy some, a, a, a bottle of Diet 7-Up. But there's families where I live on the border that shop there exclusively because that's the cheapest place to buy your groceries. If you go to a family dollar or a dollar general, look at the label on the back of, of what you're buying there, whether it be uh, you know, insecticide, whether it be you know, household items made in China. They're going to keep selling those, but these people are going to pay more for their products, more for their products. Um, all of us are going to kind of go through this, this wave where we're going we're to feel it in our checkbook. Now, I want to get back to talking about uh, the tariff threats with Mexico and President Trump's language with Mexico. It seems like every six months, every four to six months, President Trump tweets out and lashes out at Mexico for different things, whether it's trade. Uh, most recently, it's been uh, accusing them of not doing enough to stop migration. Does President Trump have... Uh, an incentive to keep making Mexico the so-called bad guy? I think there's a disincentive in doing that because Mexico has a choice. Um, there, if you look at what China's done in the last 10 to 15 years, they are constantly in Latin America. They're, they're, they're at trade shows, they're investing, they're working with local governments. Uh, and my big fear is if we keep kicking our neighbor, uh, which is a good neighbor. Mexico's been a good neighbor. You can't imagine the amount of programs we have on cross-border security, cross-border trade. We work very closely with our Mexican counterparts on, on, uh, in industry on the other side, but Mexico has a choice. Uh, my big fear is that they get sick of this and they say, come on China, welcome China, and they start doing that business with China and we lose uh, a, a chunk of our economic growth and potential because we beat a neighbor. Now, with the China issue, sure, you got to get tough with China because it, it does things that are very unfair from a trade standpoint. And that, in that sense, I support the administration taking action. I don't know if tariffs in this sense and going to a showdown where 100 percent of, of both countries' products are tariffed, I don't know if that's the best way to do that because it doesn't, I'll give you a, a, a neat little fact. Since this whole debacle started with China, our trade deficit it keeps going up. And that was one of the reasons why the president instituted this. But I do not advocate picking on our neighbors, uh, which form our North American trading bloc. We need Canada, we need Mexico as a, a nation, the U.S. does, to remain competitive against Asia, against Europe. We work together and we shouldn't be picking on our neighbors. Now, it's no secret that President Trump uh, has been calling for a border wall to be established and funding for that wall to be included uh, in, in the budget and in any s sort of border security agreement. And um, there's also been recently a local uh, group that has fundraised money to build a private border wall on private land uh, in Sunland Park, not too far, right next to where you're working right there. Sure. I, I'd like to hear your thoughts on on the border wall and what just happened recently in Sunland Park, does that impact your your business in any way? Uh, not a smidgen. And if, you, um, if you're familiar with that area, the Mount Cristo Rey area there, it's mountainous, big old mountain. The wall, let me, let me give you a scale. The mountain's like this, the wall's like this. Mm -hmm. um, 
I, I, I was thinking the other day, government projects usually cost more than the private sector because there's more layers of bureaucracy and more requirements. This group that built the wall in Sunland Park proved the exact opposite. They estimate that that wall cost six to seven, six to eight million dollars for about a half a mile stretch. Government work or government contractors that do the wall and did the extension do that at a quarter of that price. Now, I understand that was, that was more of a statement. I mean, and if you see the wall, it kind of climbs a little bit up the mountain. It's got a very nice concrete road next to it, I guess for border patrol or what have you. But it's a question of if you're, if you're a desperate migrant, you're just gonna go around. I mean, it's, it's not gonna stop anybody. And I think it, it, it was necessary for that particular group which had its members grumbling about, hey, we donated to you and we, you haven't done anything. So they hurriedly put up that wall and made a statement. And I get that, that's more political than functional. Now, we just have about a minute left, but I'd like to hear your, your kind of closing thoughts on this and, and how you think um, we're gonna, are we gonna get any resolution with this trade war? Uh, you know, we've obviously had this issue with tariffs with Mexico. China and the United States, do you see anything happening in the near future to where China, the United States are going to have an agreement and we're going to have to actually, a, a, I guess, solid agreement with the United States and Mexico? Well, with Mexico, I'm more optimistic and positive. We need Mexico. Mexico needs us. Uh, and there's a lot more wiggle room there because it's nebulous as to what Mexico is going to deliver to us in terms of increased security against, you know, the migrants coming to our border. With China, that's a lot more scary because we've dug our heels in and that's a continuing thing that's gone on for a long time. And we're heading to a deadline here where the only thing other than backing away uh, the Trump administration and Xi in, in, in China is going forward and saying 100% of those tariff, you know, whatever, 100% of the goods are tariffed. That I'm not so optimistic on and that worries me quite a bit. Okay, unfortunately, we are out of time. Jerry, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much, Anthony. And we want to thank you for joining us on Fronteras at Changing America. I'm Anthony Moreno.